Hi everybody, Craig Fay here, stand-up comedian podcast host, and I am very excited to introduce you to this video series where I am going to build a clock. Now, anytime I tell people that's what I'm going to do, they always have the same question, which is, why? Like, why don't I just buy a clock, or why don't I just use my phone? And sure, yeah, if all I wanted was something that could tell the time, I already have lots of things that can do that. I have my phone, I have my laptop, I have an alarm clock, I have multiple watches. In my kitchen alone, I've got clocks on my stove, my microwave, and even my coffee maker even though that hasn't kept accurate time since I fixed it, which, uh, you know, bodes well for this project. I'm also not doing this video because I'm some sort of expert sharing my skills and knowledge in some sort of how-to video. Um, I mean, I'm going to show you how I do things, but I'm no expert. I'm not a clocksmith. I barely have any experience actually building things. And guess what? This is actually the first time I've ever done this. So I'm not going to end up with some sort of elegant display piece that I'm going to show to people visiting my apartment. No, what I'm going to end up with at the end of this is a big, ugly mess of a clock that might not even work. In this series, I'm going to learn and share with you what makes a clock literally tick. And in that process, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to break things. I'm going to miscalculate. I'm going to mismeasure. I'm going to misinterpret. I'm going to encounter problems that I never expected to encounter. And I'm going to share with you exactly how I solve them. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try things without being intimidated by the fact that I don't know everything. And without the expectation that everything has to work perfectly like well, like clockwork. And at the end of that, hopefully, I've learned something, you've learned something, and we end up with a big, ugly mess of a clock. Okay, so now that we've moved to my workshop slash office slash exercise room slash spare bedroom, we can start work on the first thing that our clock is going to need, which is a power source. Now, if you have ever had a watch battery die, or if you've ever had to run out of your house in the morning in a panic because the power went out in the middle of the night and your alarm clock didn't go off, then you understand how important a power source is. A power source is what makes a clock actually run. Now, in both of those cases, the power source is electricity, either from the battery or from plugging it into a wall outlet. But you can also use a spring that you can wind up and store energy that way, like in some old school mechanical watches. But in our case, what we're going to use is we're going to use a power source that's far more common, freely available and easy to harness. And that is gravity. So here it is, the big ugly mess of a clock power source mark one it's actually a pretty simple device because harnessing gravity is pretty simple uh, if you lift a weight up and let it go it will fall it will fall 100 percent of the time super reliable all this does is it turns falling into spinning and we do that by we have three boards which i have screwed together i've drilled a hole in either side so this shaft can go through and then wrapped a rope around there so as the weight pulls the rope the shaft spins. I'm not going to waste your time by explaining to you how ropes work. Uh, I should point out though that both of these were supposed to be the same height. Uh, they are not. I promised you mistakes and you're getting them. The only thing worth noting mechanically about this power source is this ratchet mechanism right here. So ratchets are used whenever we want something to rotate one way and not the other. In our case, this is going to allow me to wind up the power source without having to worry about the weight crashing down on my feet if I accidentally let it go. So ratchets consist of a wheel with teeth on it and a lever like this. In watchmaking and clockmaking, this lever is called a click because you guessed it, it clicks. When I rotate the shaft in the direction that we want, the curved portion of the tooth pushes the click up until it falls back down behind the tooth. This allows the shaft to rotate freely until I try and rotate it the opposite direction, in which case the flat surface of the tooth jams up against the click and stops the entire shaft from moving. I made this by tracing the pattern onto a quarter inch piece of board and then cutting it out using my Dremel rotary tool. That may not be the perfect tool for the job, but it's the one that fits in my apartment and I'm betting pretty heavily on it being the jack of all trades for this project. 
I then took the cut out and glued it onto the shaft and put some nails in there for good measure because I didn't trust the glue. This also isn't the first attempt at a ratchet. Uh, the first one I made too small and forgot to drill the hole into first, so as soon as I drilled through it, the entire board became delaminated and fell apart. So now that the power source is fully built, it is time to test it out. Now, I've added this cardboard disc onto the shaft so we can see it rotate a little easier. But to get it started, all we need to do is wind it up. And when we're ready to go, all we do is release the click and... Hmm. I promise you destruction. I'm bringing you destruction. Okay, so here's what I think went wrong. So on the shaft, I put one of these collars, and the point of that was just to stop the shaft from sliding back and forth. And the first one that I built, I tried cutting out of the board using my Dremel and uh, a coping saw, which turns out to be a very hard way to cut a circle. So as you can see, there it's very uneven. There's lots of rough edges on it. And what I think happened is one of those rough edges just caught on the base, and there was enough force uh, to split it along the grain like that. So, for its replacement, what I did was I went out and got a hole saw, and in addition to that being much, much easier, uh, it also hasn't exploded yet, so hooray. Uh, okay, so now with a couple tweaks, let's try this again. So here the power source is spinning, and it's also where we encounter our first real design problem that isn't just me screwing up. So obviously it's running kind of fast, it's hard to read, but the real problem isn't that it's going fast, the real problem is that it's speeding up. If we slow down the video to one quarter speed, we can see that a little easier. Each time the arrows line up, the disc has completed one revolution, and we can figure out how long each one takes. Knowing that the video is shot at 24 frames per second, we can count the frames, do a little math, and we find out that the first rotation takes 0.56 seconds. The next one is 0.45 seconds, then 0 0.39, 0 0.37, and 0.33 seconds. After that, the disc is moving too fast for my camera and the images begin to blur, but the pattern is obvious. Each rotation is taking less time than the one before it. And converting that all into a rotational speed, we find that the first rotation is moving at 1.8 revolutions per second, the next 2.2 revolutions per second, then 2.6, 2.7, and finally three revolutions per second. The rotational speed is going up. You've probably never thought about it this way before, but what we need in order to have a usable clock is a constant rotational speed. The second hand of a clock completes one revolution every 60 seconds. The minute hand completes one revolution every 60 minutes, and the hour hand completes one revolution every 12 hours, or two revolutions per day. These are all constant rotational speeds. If our second hand took 60 seconds to complete its first revolution, 50 seconds to complete the next one, 40 seconds to complete the one after that, it would be almost impossible to tell what time it is, which is why it is so important that the rotational speed is constant and doesn't speed up or slow down. Unfortunately, gravity doesn't provide a constant speed, gravity provides a constant force. That force is equal to the mass of whatever it's acting on multiplied by g, the strength of gravity at Earth, which is 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Therefore, a one kilogram mass is going to provide 9.81 newtons of force. Now, this constant force is actually pretty handy for a power source because it's dependable, it's reliable, it never changes. But we run into problems when we're forced to consider this equation right here. F equals MA, or force equals mass times acceleration. This was proposed by some forgotten physicist named Sir Isaac Newton, and only applies to everything, everywhere, all the time, so easy to miss. What this is saying is that any time that we have force, it's going to cause acceleration. Now you can play around with these numbers all you want. You can make the force really low, or you can make the mass really high, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna make the acceleration really low, or mean that it's not going to speed up as much or as quickly, but regardless, you still have acceleration, you're still going to be speeding up. So what we really need is some sort of device 
that can take that constant force and constant acceleration provided by our power source and turn it into the constant speed that we need in order to tell time. Now that's no easy task, that's no easy problem to solve, but it's one we're going to start to look at in our next episode where we start building one of the most ingenious devices ever created, the Verge Escapement. Now, that's it for this episode. Uh, thank you much, so much for watching. If you enjoyed yourself, uh, please feel free to like and subscribe. Also, make sure to hit that little bell in the corner so you are notified when new episodes are available. And hey, we're all learning here, so if there's something that you want to know more or less about, something you want explained more or less, let me know about it in the comment section. Until next time, uh, thank you for watching. My name is Craig Fay.